Okay, so <clears throat> I've taken the view that the, uh, the best way to try and predict the future is to have a little look at the, uh, the past. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off just talking a bit about where we've been with the uh, development of AI uh, over the years, where we are now, and then try and project that a little bit into to where we're going. And that's particularly where the, uh, the generative part comes in, because that's been the, the big revolution that, uh, that we're seeing. Um, so, starting at the past, and uh, I'll just point out as well, by the way, you'll see lots of artwork. None of it's been created by a human. So it's all generative, as is a lot of the, uh, the content you'll see through here. Um, so it's all been shown for the first time, and 100% uh, by uh, generative AI. So let's just start with a little timeline. Um, really, we started off <coughs> back at the beginning when deep learning was um, just before it came in, 2010. Is, is the starting point for me, really, with this ImageNet competition. So some of you will be familiar with this, and competitions have proven to be a fantastic way of really galvanizing the industry. So this is a, a challenge that was set up um, part, related to, uh, to acad academia and uh, conferences around uh, computer vision, but it was how many images can you recognize, basically. And then I'm sure you'll remember Siri and Watson beating the, the Jeopardy champions. That was uh, when we started to see something interesting happening, things being achieved that hadn't been done previously. Um, but it wasn't really um, at the stage where it was usable. But this was the key date, 2012. So <clears throat> something called AlexNet won the, that ImageNet competition. So two years in, but it didn't just win it. It smashed everything else uh, out of the competition completely. And it was using a deep neural network. Your networks are nothing new, but all of a sudden they're working on a scale that had never been seen before. And that had huge implications for me because um, this deep learning drive started. Um, and you'll remember in the mi middle of that, you'll have seen DeepMind and AlphaGo um, being used to beat world champions at, um, at the game of Go. Something that was always held, certainly when I was um, studying at university, was held as the pinnacle. Once that happened, you know, that was the, the, the point of no return. That's when AI was getting better than humans. And we saw that coming in with the um, Lisa Doll being beaten at that point. But for me, I was uh, in face recognition um, primarily at the time. And we just won the competition for the best face rec in the world in 2014, not using deep learning. And we held that title for a, a short time before all of a sudden this strange new thing called deep learning came in and again smashed everything out in terms of face rec. And our 40 man years of effort that had gone into that system that some of you have probably have been through in Heathrow Airport all of a sudden got destroyed in about two weeks. So we had to take on deep learning as did most people in the uh, computer vision industry. Then we saw transformers coming in and some of you will be familiar with BERT. This is really when NLP started to get its acceleration. Um, and that's ultimately what's led to what we're seeing today with the likes of uh, ChatGPT. So NLP saw its um, acceleration go on and it started to branch out. We saw different things going on with AlphaFold um, predicting proteins. So we're seeing AI achieving things that humans couldn't do then. We saw OpenAI start to release their first versions of uh, GPT these large language models. Transformers went then um, into the uh, trillion parameters um, with, uh, with Google's switch transformer there. DALI, vision transformers, stable diffusion, all names I'm sure you'll be familiar with now. Um, <coughs> that's all part of uh, the generative AI. And, uh, and then right up to the present day where we're seeing ChatGPT is being adopted. And it's a, it's a breakthrough that has been coming a long time, but it just went over that tipping point where all of a sudden it's in that uncanny valley where it feels like you're now talking to a human. And uh, that's what's really captured um, people's imagination. But to, to look at how the, uh, the markets have sort of um, been following that, the, the investment into AI has been just going up and up and up. Data on 2022, not quite finalized yet. Um, there may be a slowdown in that. But um, what we have seen recently is that 2022, the market opportunity was rated at 136 billion and uh, projected to go out to 1.5 trillion by 2030. So it's not slowing down, it's speeding up and the, uh, the opportunities in this space are absolutely ginormous. 
Uh, this graph <coughs> um, was something I found that I thought was really interesting. I just wanted to try and share with you what's going on here. So we're looking at the amount of computing resource being used on some of these, um, these deep learning models. And you'll see the ones at the top there, the GPT-3, uh, Lambda, Palm, etc. These are the large language models that we're now starting to see these breakthroughs. But I thought, well, this is, a, this is clearly showing um, acceleration. You're seeing it, it ra rapidly go up here as we get towards the sort of current, uh, current dates. But if you start to look just a little bit more closely, you'll notice that this, um, this y-axis is, um, is logarithmic. Now, for those not into data science, <coughs> logarithmic axes are usually used when you've got an exponential increase in something and you want to visualize it linearly. Yeah? So you turn that exponential curve, which is difficult because it just disappears right off the top of the screen. You want to make it into a linear curve, so you use a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. The weird thing here is that it's still curving up, even on a log logarithmic scale. It's moving faster than exponential acceleration. <clears throat> and right up at the top here, we haven't even got to the, um, the GPT 3.5 um, which led to ChatGPT. But it, it's getting faster and faster. And <clears throat> looking at where we're getting to in terms of human level performance, and this, is a, this graph is now a few years out of date, but it shows this is ni nicely presented because we've got human level performance there at zero. And it's showing various human style tasks like handwriting recognition, speech, image, comprehension, and how they've all started to, uh, to ramp up. And, we just started to see things like handwriting recognition and speech tipping over into the as good as a human a few years ago. Um, but more recently, language understanding has started to go up. <coughs> and this is, again, before ChatGPT um, had come in. And it continues to accelerate. So we're still in the past at the moment. <coughs> and just when we were getting to this sort of stage a few years ago, these were seen as the, the last remaining domains of humanity, the awkward areas. As I'd said, we'd seen computer vision, face recognition was getting dominated, as was lots of different recognition tasks. But things like planning, they're a bit awkward. You know, how exactly is a neural network going to do that with deep learning? We weren't really sure. Agency, well, how does a, a system operate within its environment, alter its environment, and then react to those alterations? bit tricky to adaptability well that's something humans are really good at but anyone in the machine learning space will know if you train a, a, a neural network to recognize cats it'll only recognize cats it's not going to do anything else for you so that adaptability <coughs> was a problem and then creativity um, you know what what does it really mean to be creative is difficult to define it was assumed that artificial intelligence wasn't going to get there but then sitting in the middle of all of this is this comprehension uh, question. And again, we're getting into territory here where it's really difficult to define what we mean. Does a machine understand this? Does it really understand it at a level? Or are we just looking at sort of mathematical models that you know it plots on a curve and that comes back with something that feels reasonably good? Or does it actually understand what's going on? So coming to the present then, where are we now? with those, uh, those last remaining domains of humanity. And uh, I've got some really nice examples to, um, to show. So let's just have a look at agency first. Um, now this is actually a, a couple of years old, um, but just to explain what's go going on here. So it's a game, <coughs> hide and seek. You've got blue guys, red guys, and it's a simple hide and seek game. One's trying to find the other. The environment is a real, simulated environment so it's a proper physical space yeah there's no simplified game here they can move around they can move objects they can see each other but other than that it's pretty much an open world and these guys have got a neural network behind them which is <coughs> not trained in anything it's just asked to go off into this environment use agency to try and solve the game so <coughs> we'll have a look at what happens Red guy spots the blue guys, he's won. A little bit further in, they're starting to learn they can move things around, but they're still losing. Eventually, the blue guys start to discover 
that they can move blocks into places which are going to give them a, uh, a certain advantage um, and eventually get to a point where they can do peculiar things. Oh, it's uh, skipped over too far. See if we can get this back. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Eventually, you start to see things like this happen where, ah, it's breaking again. The red agent has discovered a flaw in the system where it can then get into these locked areas to discover the blue guy. Now, <coughs> the peculiar thing here is when they were generating this artificial environment, um, they never actually conceived that uh, the agents might climb on top of some of these objects. And there wasn't programmed into the simulation uh, something stopping them from moving objects they were stood on. But what the, uh, the red agent did there was discovered that with these ramps, they could actually climb on top of the object. They could push an object that they were standing on, which you know, obviously isn't with reality, but within the environment they're working in. And that could then give them the ability to get into these sort of locked areas where the, the blue guy's hidden himself away. So what we've seen here is that both the agents have learned to manipulate their environment. The blue guy has learned to hide himself away and lock objects so he can't be seen. The red agent has used, to, used objects to actually get round, use flaws in the system to, to get round the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the innovation of the blue guy here. So agency is basically solved now. Adaptability, <coughs> well, again, this is something that came in um, a few years ago and is, is now absolute commonplace. So transfer learning is really what adaptability is about. So we're seeing things like <coughs> large uh, neural networks will be trained on things like ImageNet um, as a pre-training basis to move to other things. And this is now standard practice uh, within the machine learning space. Uh, large language models can be tuned to new tasks, and you're seeing that happen a lot. Um, in fact, the ChatGPT uh, revolution was about a, a fine tuning that came on the back of a large language model training. And then you've got things like the latent space of language models, that is the core of the neural network for things like language models, can start to be transferred to other languages. Now, so that's not training a new neural network that then goes and learns a new language from scratch. There's something conceptual at the core of that neural network that actually understands real concepts, not the language around the concepts, but the actual concepts. And then if you use that neural network, it's a much shorter training task to convert that to a new language. Um, and then similarly, the, uh, the, the combination of internal concepts for language being then mapped over to the, uh, the equivalent in vision. So you've got two modes of data there, but actually using the same internal concepts within neural networks. And this is a very powerful tool, and we use it every day in our, our projects. So adaptability, basically done. So what about planning? <coughs> Another little game. Um, so to explain this, there's a neural network behind this little uh, orange block. Um, and it starts off with nothing. It just has to learn to get through its environment. And there's various obstacles like this that this, um, this little agent needs to work out how to do. But it's tricky. To open the door, you've got to do multiple things, like step on these two green squares. It requires a plan to do it. You've got to maneuver around these obstacles. So it doesn't always start off well, but it can start to learn some pretty complex moves, then doesn't always get it right. So falling off, falls on its face, has to start again, go back and, uh, and try another time. But look at the sort of level it can get to eventually, <clears throat> through planning to move through the environment at just the right time to avoid the various obstacles, get all the green uh, things pressed, and then get out the, the exit. So this sort of ability to plan into the future and work your way through these complex tasks, again, problem that was solved by things like Q-learning, if you're familiar with that term. 
comprehension. Uh, this brings us back up to really why we're here today. This is what I think has, um, has just been proven now with the, uh, the latest releases of things like ChatGPT. Um, <coughs> so we're, what are we talking about comprehension? We're re really talking about <coughs> understanding that's come through this, uh, this breakthrough, <laughs> as I say. Now, what was it? Really, that the last missing piece was this reinforcement learning with human feedback. Um, so what essentially has happened with the, this breakthrough is large language models have been trained on huge amounts of data, things like internet scale, just train it on everything on the internet, and it learns to model the language. But that wasn't quite enough. That's where we were with GPT-3, 3.5. But to get it that little bit further into that uncanny valley I was talking about earlier, where it now suddenly seems human, what they did was have huge, huge teams to monitor the output and give it some reinforcement. Uh, this is a good phrase, that's a bad phrase, this one was better than that one. And then use that to fine tune the network afterwards. That's a slight oversimplification of what they did, but that was basically it. So not any new rocket science coming in there, just techniques that have been used before. There's also the size, so it's 175 billion connections in uh, GPT uh, 3.5. So very, very large, one of the largest um, uh, neural networks that have ever been trained. Um, but then interestingly, when we got through, through to the breakthrough, it was actually 10 times smaller um, than the previous version. So it's getting better, but getting smaller in size. So what do we mean by comprehension? Just for those that may not be familiar, it's, it's still not absolutely readily available. We have a, a premium account and got in quite early. So I've just got some examples to show you the sort of thing I mean by comprehension. So you can, you can ask uh, ChatGPT for um, anything you like. Um, and I'm trying out uh, something here that's previously been very, very difficult for AI to work with. So I'm setting up uh, a scene about the real world. It requires lots of assumptions. It requires lots of background knowledge about you know, what, a, what a cup is. If I put it on the chair, and then move the chair, does the cup go with it? You've got to have a model of the world to understand these things. You've got to understand what a cat is, you know, that it might have a stomach and it's going to want to eat things. And uh, there's a lot to sort of get your head around and work out what's going on in this sort of sentence. It requires more than just an understanding of the words themselves and a breaking it down into the various clauses that are there. But it, it really requires a, a, a knowledge of the world. So this is, this is where things really struggle. So I tried this with um, ChatGPT, and um, actually the response wasn't that good. It's pretty good, but it you know, didn't quite get there. So what it says is, um, I'll just read that out for those that, that can't quite see that. I put a chocolate button in a thimble, which I placed in a coffee cup on a chair in the lounge. I moved the chair into the kitchen. The cat came into the kitchen looking for food, knocked over the chair, and ate everything it could find. After cleaning up the maze, mess, I place the coffee cup in the sink. Where is the chocolate button? So <coughs> I think we would all agree the chocolate button's in the cat. Chat GPT, not quite sure. Based on the information provided, it's unclear whether it's still in the thimble or if the cat ate it along with the other items on the chair. So it's ate the chocolate button and the coffee cup. If the chocolate button was in the thimble and the chair was knocked over, it could be in the kitchen or potentially somewhere else if it rolled away. If the chocolate button was eaten by the cat, then it's digested and no, like, you know, it's, it's kind of got there. It's impressive, but not quite there. And I wanted to use this as an example of showing you exactly where AI was getting to. You know, it's, it's really good. It's not quite there. And that's what was in my presentation until a couple of days ago. <laughs> and then they released GPT-4, so I had to come back and update it. And GTP-4 says, the chocolate button is most likely in your cat's stomach since it ate everything it could find when it knocked over the chair. That is the rapid movement we're at at this stage. You know, that just within, within the last few weeks has gone from that to that. The, the edge is getting pushed back um, every day. So on to our, our final point, creativity. These are all image, images that have been created with generative AI. So you all have heard of Stable Diffusion, DALI, those sort of uh, generative AI models. <coughs> They've never been, they don't exist in reality. And it's not just with images. Um, 
we can work with text as well. So I tried another one with uh, GPT-4. Write a poem about artificial intelligence being discussed at the Williams F1 experience in the style of Wordsworth. And GPT-4 gives us this. Amidst the roar of engine's might, where Williams F1's dreams take flight, their gathered minds in awe discuss artificial minds like us. In, cir <coughs> in circuitry and algorithms, the scholars seek new catechisms. And AI learns the racing lines, our fates entwined, progress defines. Now, as a uh, lifelong computer scientist with relatively little uh, literary skill, I'm a, <laughs> you know, uh, aware that I'm not the best judge, but that seems pretty good to me. Um, but there's also a few scary things in there. Artificial lines, minds like us, it's referring to itself, and it's using the royal we, which um, I'm not quite sure, sure where that comes from. But this is the sort of thing, I mean, again, I can guarantee you Wordsworth never wrote anything of the sort, but it is following the style, and again, a, a good example of creativity. Not everyone likes Wordsworth, so if you're not a fan of Wordsworth, how about Snoop Dogg? So I ask it, that's great, can you do the same thing, but this time in the style of Snoop Dogg? I promised I wasn't going to try and wrap it. <laughs> but again, those that can't, uh, can't quite make that out, because it is small. Yo, at the F1 experience, we chill. <coughs> Williams Racing show an AI skill, generating minds up to the place, merging tech and speed, embrace the race. Algorithms fly in, circuits tight, Snoop style wisdom, AI insight, rolling with the future side by side, this racing word, we're going to glide. Boom. So, again, you know, completely different styles. This is not something that specializes. Like, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's not something that specializes. It, it, the end to what these things can generate is absolutely colossal. So let's, uh, let's now take a, a bit of a look as to, you know, can we measure the ability of these things? And I, I apologize for the, the tiny writing um, across the bottom. There's just too much to fit in. But to give you an idea of what's going on here. So this is um, a score of exam results, basically normalized um, there uh, according to what the human um, uh, readers, uh, uh, human exam takers have, uh, have sat. Um, so, in other words, most humans are um, on that line there. If you get above 50%, you, you're doing better than most humans. This is GPT-3, um, and as you can see, it's doing really well. It's beating most humans on a broad range of subjects. What sort of subjects are we talking about? Well, these ones, if you can just make out a AP in the front, these, these are sort of the US equivalent of A-levels. Um, and you've got different subjects such as environmental science, you've got uh, US history, uh, you've got world history, biology, microeconomics, etc. Um, and uh, yep, there's a lot that it's not doing so well on, um, but it's doing pretty well. And then GPT-4 came along and it did that. And now we've got most of the tests performing better than most of the humans. Bearing in mind, again, this is something that have, th this development from blue to green has been in about the last month. Um, some really interesting ones to point out here. Um, so this one here, that is the uniform bar exam legal qualification. So this is scoring 95% on the, um, the bar exam which is better than most lawyers will have qualified with. <clears throat> and if we take this just a little bit further, because this GPT-4 had no vision. It could only read the text. If you introduce vision, then you see another few things shoot up as well. So things like macroeconomics probably had a lot of graphs in it. So it has to be able to look at the graphs to interpret the data and answer the question. So actually it was hamstrung. You, you essentially had someone that was blind trying to sit these exams with pictures in them on the previous one. 
and again, that, that's just in the, uh, the last few weeks, really, that that, uh, that sort of development has come about. But I think the most extraordinary thing for me here is that there's two things. One is this normalization of the human scores, this is people that are sitting these exams, so they've done the studies. It's not just random people off the street gone and been put into some biology exam. These are people that took the biology course, then sat the exam, and this, uh, this AI is beating it. But it's not just beating them in that subject. It's beating them in all the subjects. It's the same AI. So we've now got an AI that is more equipped across more subjects, probably than any human has really been able to do. I mean, most people study maybe three or four A levels. Um, and you wouldn't have a chance of passing the exam in some of the other ones, whereas this is doing it across everything. And if you want to do it <coughs> across more subjects, then you just take this one and you train it a bit further and you carry on. So you get this <coughs> effect where things just keep building on top of each other. And <coughs> moving on now to, well, is this actually useful? Are we going to be able to do it, anything with it? And the answer to that is definitely yes, just based on these figures alone. So what we're looking at here is the, uh, the amount of time it took for services to reach um, 1 million users on this side. Um, so if you look at things like Netflix, Airbnb, Twitter, etc., you've got things like 3.5 years, 2 years to reach 1 million users. That tiny thing at the bottom there that you almost can't see is ChatGPT, and that took 5 days. So what network, Netflix took 3.5 years to achieve, it did in five days. So what about 100 million, million year users? You're really going up the scale. Similarly, we see exactly the same sort of effect. So it, this wasn't a blip of, um, of just uh, sudden excitement around it and they, they got huge numbers in, in short days. It's carried on. So they've gone up to 100 million users and that was done in two months. Um, whereas you look at something like uh, Instagram, took 30 uh, to get there, Spotify, 55. Um, <clears throat> so people are certainly going to it in droves, and I suggest that that means they're finding it very useful because this is beyond the level where it's a, a technological marvel for geeks like uh, us in Deeper Insights, just go and have a go at it because we're interested. This is being used for, for real things. Okay, so that's the present. That's where we, we've come up to. So let's try and project that out a little bit further now as to where we're going. And we'll start that with limitations. So there's got to be some problems with these systems. <coughs> and um, one of them is no live information. That changed the day before yesterday. Um, I didn't have time to update my slide. Um, but uh, chat GPT and GPT-4 uh, have no live information. BARD does. That's the difference. And there's also plugins coming out now that give them access to live information. Cost is high and uh, causality and explainability as well. So what are we talking about there? I'll give you an, an idea. What is the current price of gold on the global market? And <clears throat> I'm an AI language model and I cannot provide real-time information. Okay, so it, it, just, it just doesn't know. Um, or another example, what is the UK government doing to tackle illegal immigration, particularly with respect to small boats crossing the channel? Um, this is something that's been in the news for quite a while. And the response is interesting. It says, as of my knowledge cutoff date in September 2021, that's the last information it, it, it's got, 2021. So it's actually quite behind in terms of the information it's have, had access to. And that's because of the way these things are trained. You have to take huge amounts of data, pull it off the internet, get it all organized on some storage, process that all into a form where the AI can train. It takes a long time. Then the training, then that reinforcement uh, learning with human feedback we mentioned, that takes a long time with groups of people. So you've got this long chain of events that have to take place before you release your model. And when you do, it's already out of date. It doesn't stop it being useful, but it's definitely a limitation. Cost is a problem. So you can't get information on the very latest, but GPT-3, which is larger, single training session is estimated at $1.4 million to train that. In one training session, it will have taken many to get to its level. 
um, and th but that might be the sort of training you need to do if you want to repurpose it. The deployment is estimated at 30,000 NVIDIA A100 GPU equivalent. <clears throat> the hardware won't be exactly the same, but that's the sort of computing power that it's, um, it's running on live. Um, <clears throat> and they believe the capital outlay to, uh, to get there was uh, $800 million. And uh, the daily electricity cost of just running it day to day is uh, $50,000. So this is not something that's in the realms of everyday companies, um, <clears throat> but that is gonna change and we'll, we'll see where that goes. And then of course the causality and explainability, what that's really about is trust. You all have seen all sorts of things in the newspaper about inaccurate information, they call it hallucinations, getting things wrong. How do you know what it's saying is right or not? Again, doesn't stop it being useful, but it definitely has big implications. You have no idea what, it, what it's saying is true. You then have to go and look that up yourself. Okay, but the, the real thing that's gonna change things is we haven't even seen the competition yet. Um, it's only just getting started. We had OpenAI's ChatGTP came out, and, um, and then we went on to, um, uh, to uh, GPT-4. But already, uh, as I said, just within the month or so afterwards, We've seen Google's Bard, Meta's Llama, NVIDIA's Megatron Turing, which has been around a bit longer, but continues to be retrained and improved, and uh, Databricks' Dolly, which is probably the newest one that just popped out very recently. So everyone's following in, in the wake. They can see the, the uptake that we talked about earlier, reaching 100 million users, so everyone's coming in on that. There's lots of different companies related to Google, so within Google Research, we're seeing Palm, Lambda, Glam, these are perhaps smaller models, um, but fine-tuned and more easily accessible than those from OpenAI. Um, and DeepMind's Gopher as well, um, where they're p putting their particular efforts. Uh, Stanford in Academia has uh, released Alpaca, uh, again, at similar sort of scale. <coughs> and this one's really interesting. So Hugging Face, for those that aren't familiar, is, um, is really sort of a, an organization where the AIs are being provided open source, so all the weights are available. Um, it's more a, a sort of collaborative hub than, um, than a, a company as such. Um, and they've got Bloom, so these models are being made available for people to use. You can take that and use it and repurpose it, and they're under all sorts of licenses that makes that very easy to do uh, with no, um, uh, no IP uh, issues. And now we're seeing the partnerships coming in to sort of strategically place themselves with how to deal with this. Microsoft with OpenAI, you, you'll have seen. AWS, um, interestingly, has announced a, a, a partnership with Hugging Face, so going for a, a different angle there. And we're gonna see much more of this uh, happening as uh, time goes on. Um, NVIDIA's just partnering with us um, as one example. So, so <clears throat> in terms of scaling up then, um, we've had a look at where things are going, this competition's happening. That's gonna drive this. And I've just done a, a simple thing here where I'm looking at Moore's Law, which is every two years, the um, hardware um, capacity doubles. And what happens if you apply that to the number of neurons in these neural nets we're working with? And just as a, a little example, um, honeybee brain, um, the honeybee was always the, the creature I used to, used to use when I'd talk about the, uh, the deep learning models would be on the um, the sort of magnitude of a honeybee brain with 100,000 neurons and about a billion synapse connections. Um, so moving on though now, because honeybee brains are too small, mouse brain, about 71 million neurons with about 100 billion connections. And that's about where we are with GPT-3, although it just slightly exceeds that with 175 billion connections. Um, so GPT, technology is slightly bigger than a mouse brain. Imagine if a mouse was quoting Wordsworth poems or making up Snoop Dogg raps. Yep, there's something not quite right here. There's, there's, a, there's a, um, a difference in how efficient, how optimal things are. Um, and the human brain has 86 billion neurons 
um, and we're not quite sure, but maybe somewhere in the, the region of 100 um, to 1,000 trillion connections. If you have a look at those on this Moore's Law graph, there's the mouse brain, GPT-3 just slightly ahead. We've hardly started on the curve. Um, human brain's there. That's 23 years ahead. So we've got about 23 years if Moore's Law is followed with the number of neuron connections until we're training neural networks on the same scale as the human brain quite readily. But it's a bit more scary than that um, because LLMs are not increasing at Moore's Law. It's about 10 times faster. That's the, the graph I showed you earlier where the exponential curve on a logarithmic scale still looks exponential. A lot of this is being driven by um, specialist hardware. So we attended um, the, uh, the NVIDIA um, uh, conference just the other week and uh, Jensen was saying how they are now developing not GPUs for gaming that are then repurposed to, um, to AI, but actually now specialist AI-based hardware for different types of AI, so three flavors really for three different uh, types of training. That level of acceleration is what's allowing um, neural networks to, to go at a faster rate than Moore's Law. You're not waiting for the CPUs to ca catch up. They're developing hardware specific to the AI algorithms that are allowing that to go at much, much faster rates. So does that mean that those 23 years is more like two or three years? Probably does. Um, and we're already seeing reports of systems exceeding 100 trillion parameters. Um, so there's um, Microsoft's uh, um, <coughs> and um, some Chinese companies are reporting systems where they're looking at about 100 trillion, which is the lower estimate of the human brain. So it's getting to that sort of scale today. Um, and then the really interesting question is not really looking at how far we're going up here. But when we get to there, even if Moore's law, the slower law, is followed, the year after, or two years after, I should say, we'll be on things that are twice the number of connections in the human brain, so double the capacity. And that's where things will start to get really interesting. So where's the <coughs> primary research at the moment? Well, <coughs> improved neural language understanding, Generalize, um, generalization transfer learning, reinforcement learning advancements, energy efficiency, and explainability and interoperability. So a lot of the areas we've talked about before, but are already being knocked down very, very quickly. But this is where the majority of the research is. And interestingly, to, to sum all this up, as I was talking with my colleagues in taxi just now, these aren't huge new discoveries that are advancing these. GPT-3 to chat GTP, a GPT, um, did not discover some new algorithm. All they did was take stuff that had already been done and applied one of the other algorithms that had already been done as a secondary process. So just bringing two things that have been around for a few years already together and scale and hardware, sure. But we're going to see continued fast uh, rates of development that don't require any big leaps because it's just repurposing, testing different things out, exploring the space. So to, just to sort of sum up on, um, on where that brings us, we mentioned adaptability, comprehension, creativity, planning, and agency as not long ago were seen as the, the last domains of humanity. All of them, I think, have been achieved now to a human level or, or exceeded. So I think what we're going to see now is combination AIs, because I think these are achieved separately, but they're not necessarily achieved together. We're seeing things that are creative, we're seeing things that are adaptable, we're not seeing things that are both creative and adaptable. But I see these coming together in combination AIs, and that's going to be relatively easy to do, because it's just pulling together multiple systems and tying them together. And you can do that with comprehension, because once you understand what you're trying to achieve, it's relatively easy to pull things together to solve a problem. So we're going to see combination AIs, and sure enough, yeah, I didn't have time to update the presentation. Bard just did it. It's now combined agency with the comprehension to now access the web. 
But I think we'll then see a, uh, another step where we see multi multimodal neural nets come in. So rather than combining systems together, neural nets that can do all of these things together in one thing. We're already seeing that start to happen with um, things that can combine both text and vision. Yeah, stable diffusion and uh, DALI, etc. starting to do that. What happens when we combine that with planning agency and adaptability? All coming together, one neural network able to do all of those sort of things. And that's where the power is, uh, is really going to increase. And this is going to be accelerated by two things that we've already mentioned. This is ex specialist accelerative hardware, so that the, uh, the likes of what NVIDIA is releasing. As I say, we're just um, forming a partnership with them at the moment where we have now got access to that sort of specialist hardware that enables all of these things to be done on that scale. And combined with this resurgence of on-premise, so a few years ago, everything's happening in the cloud, and the cloud is really the only way to access these large GPUs. Now the cloud seems like it's getting quite expensive, and actually it's making sense to get on-premise hardware again and NVIDIA are fulfilling that market. And we're seeing things like we can actually um, start to uh, get a return on investment in hardware within you know, weeks to months. You know, it's a, it's a no-brainer. So with these two things together, driving multimodal neural nets, um, we're going to see everything to come together into a much more powerful system. And that's my prediction. Um, and it seemed like a, a, you know, a far prediction a couple of weeks ago, and it, it seems much closer even just now. So I'm just going to leave you with one, uh, one last question um, for a show of hands, just to try and drill home the sort of world we're moving into where we don't know who's doing what anymore. Did I create this presentation? No. Yes. Can I have hands for no? Hands for yes? Still some trust in humans. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs>